Final Fantasy has evolved as a franchise in numerous ways over the past 31 years, but while many of the concepts that have been fundamental to this evolution were established in the original game, there are of course other elements which originated once the franchise had already become established. Some of these didn't stand the test of time, but others have since become part of the proverbial furniture, and one such example of this was introduced in Final Fantasy V. We spoke in our last Evolutions video about boss fights, with the four fiends being our specific area of focus. This was a concept that was first introduced with the original Final Fantasy, and it acted as a pretty straightforward tribute to Japanese history and culture. Following its introduction, the concept was present in some shape or form for the next three iterations that followed, with Final Fantasy IV paying direct homage to the original Four Fiends. But by the time Final Fantasy V rolled around, the concept took a much more interesting twist, as the approach we'd previously seen was replaced by a new take on the concept that instead focused on a single antagonist that you'd square off against four times throughout the course of the game, at least in a competitive sense. This antagonist was called Gilgamesh, a character inspired by not only the Mesopotamian king of the same name, who served as the protagonist in a poem called The Epic of Gilgamesh, but also Benkei, a famed warrior monk who lived during the Heian period and ended up serving under Yoshitsune Minamoto, whose clan are also referred to as the Genji. In the context of the Final Fantasy franchise, the character they created ended up becoming something rather special, and his influence on the franchise would go on to become rather pronounced, to the point that even if you haven't ever played Final Fantasy V, you will no doubt be familiar with the existence of Gilgamesh. What's interesting though, is that there are many prominent parts to what we might as well call the Gilgamesh trope, and that's why we thought it would be a rather apt study for our next Evolutions video, because since his first appearance in Final Fantasy V, the concept, or rather the character of Gilgamesh, has evolved considerably. Which you'd kind of expect given the sheer volume of appearances he's had in both the main numbered games, but also the numerous spin-offs that have been produced. It does mean though that the structure of this video will be slightly different from the ones we've done previously, as we won't always be looking at things chronologically. So without further ado, my name is Daryl and together with Lauren, in our super granular style, we're going to be analysing the use of the Gilgamesh trope across the entire Final Fantasy franchise, starting with where it all began, in Final Fantasy V. As was common with games that had preceded Final Fantasy V, Gilgamesh acted as a general of the game's ultimate big bad, X-Death. But unlike many of the previous generals, Gilgamesh had a much more prominent role and was encountered numerous times throughout the course of the game's narrative. What's interesting is that almost all of these encounters were used to separately establish different elements that would become synonymous with Gilgamesh as a character and how he would then be portrayed in future iterations throughout the franchise. In the first encounter, for example, Gilgamesh was seen to use a rather specific type of polearm called the Naganata. This was a popular weapon during the Heian period in Japanese history, and was a weapon that Benkei, a famed warrior monk, was said to frequently use during duels. The next encounter with Gilgamesh has since become one of the most famous in the history of the franchise. It was, of course, the Clash at the Big Bridge. This acted as a standout moment in Final Fantasy V, as not only did it feature awesome music, but it also represented the first time that Gilgamesh would square off against Bartz and the other Warriors of Light. And as with Gilgamesh's use of the Naginata, having their first encounter take place in this fashion was another way that the developers paid tribute to Benkei, as his personal story was closely connected with, you guessed it, Bridges. According to historical records, Benkei is said to have challenged samurai warriors to duels on bridges, but he also made his final stand on a bridge too, as he died protecting his master, Yoshitsune Minamoto, from the forces of Yoritomo Minamoto. The third encounter with Gilgamesh took place on Zerza's ship, and this also featured some interesting morsels of information, outside of it simply being a more developed encounter strategically. One of the prominent parts of this was the appearance of Enkidu, who in Final Fantasy V was visually represented as a winged demon. Merging mythologies, this was a reference to the Mesopotamian Gilgamesh, as his closest companion was called Enkidu, 
and in the battle on Zerzer's ship, after Enkidu is defeated, Gilgamesh will choose to flee instead of continuing to fight without his ally. This is also an allusion to the epic poem, as after Enkidu is slain in the epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh becomes beset with grief and gains a new fear of death. Another notable feature of this particular battle is the appearance of Genji armor. Now this had appeared in games prior to Final Fantasy V, but its method of acquisition was changed following the arrival of Gilgamesh. As mentioned earlier, Benkei was part of the Minamoto clan, which can also be pronounced as Genji, with Gen representing Minamoto and Ji representing family. During this fight, you can, for the first time, steal Genji armor from Gilgamesh. To build out this aspect of Gilgamesh's character, Hironobu Sakaguchi stated that Gilgamesh actually obtained the armor by proving his worth in battle against other members of his village, and that the armor had been passed down in this way for centuries. This is also likely to have been a nod to samurai culture, where armor was often passed down through generations due to its inherent value. The fourth encounter with Gilgamesh took place at Castle Exdeath, assuming you chose to open the treasure chest, and it's during this fight that we learned about the true form of Gilgamesh. This also appears to have been influenced by Benkei in some fashion, as according to historical records, he was said to always carry seven weapons on his back, a sword, an axe, a rake, a sickle, a hammer, an iron staff, and the naginata. In Gilgamesh's final form, he is utilizing a two-handed sword, an axe, a flail, a shuriken, and the naginata, all at the same time. And to accommodate for this, the developers chose to give him eight arms so that he would still have two hands free. During this particular fight, we also see a glimpse of another trait Gilgamesh holds, his lust for powerful weapons. This was also kind of taken from Benkei, who used to claim the weapons of samurai he had defeated in combat, but it also has elements of the Mesopotamian Gilgamesh too, as according to Samuel Kramer, a Sumerologist, Gilgamesh became a symbol for man's vain but endless drive for fame, glory, and immortality. Within the context of Final Fantasy V, this is evident as Gilgamesh opens the treasure chest before Bart, hoping to find a unique weapon that will give him the edge in their upcoming duels. Unfortunately, he ended up finding and using a weapon native to the world called Excalibur, which of course is a play on Excalibur. This turned out to be a terrible weapon, and as a result of his poor performance in the subsequent duel, Gilgamesh was banished into the void by Exdeath, an action which all but made him immortal by accident, an allusion to Gilgamesh's goals in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The final two encounters then take place in the void, and are more ceremonial than anything else, but due to the amount of screen time Gilgamesh received and the rather obvious traits he possesses, it's possible to construct a framework for what the quintessential Gilgamesh appearance should contain. When encountered, Gilgamesh should be in a twofold quest, one, to find the strongest weapons in that world, and two, to look for challenging fights. In the case of the latter, if this challenging fight isn't with Bart, then Gilgamesh will accept duels against worthy opponents. When these duels take place, they should do so on a bridge, and it's likely that he will be supported at some point by his companion Enkidu. In terms of his weapons, well he should carry numerous, and at least one of those weapons should be native to the world he's appearing in, he should also have multiple arms in order to make use of these weapons, and he should have an affinity with the Genji armor and Gilgamesh should almost certainly act like a bit of a buffoon. Before we get on to how all of this developed throughout the series though, it is worth noting that Gilgamesh, as he appeared in Final Fantasy V, did also make a retroactive appearance in two other main series games, Final Fantasy I, Dawn of Souls, and Final Fantasy IV, The After Years. In the former instance, Gilgamesh appeared as a cameo alongside other Final Fantasy V bosses inside the Lifespring Grotto, and he picked up where he left off, continuing his search for Excalibur. But he yet again stumbled upon another version of Excalibur and was defeated when he tried to use it. In the latter, he appeared after being summoned by the creator, and upon being defeated, he called for Bart before dropping the Excalibur. The next appearance of Gilgamesh actually came in Final Fantasy VIII, as he wasn't present in the original version of Final Fantasy VI and didn't appear in any version of Final Fantasy VII. It meant that when he did resurface, Gilgamesh had been absent for seven years, and in that time, the franchise as a whole had undergone some significant changes. Almost every aspect of Final Fantasy was now amplified, from the graphics through to gameplay mechanics and music, 
and as you might expect, this also meant that there were some notable changes around how Gilgamesh appeared in Final Fantasy VIII. Perhaps the most pronounced change though, was that Gilgamesh no longer appeared as an antagonist, his role was instead changed to that of a support character. Assuming the player had acquired Odin before squaring off against Sifa in the Lunatic Pandora, upon Odin's subsequent defeat, his sword, the Zantetsuken, was thrown into the air creating a rift in the space-time continuum. This allowed Gilgamesh to escape the interdimensional rift, grab the sword and join the fray. Based on this and some of the lines of dialogue he has in the Japanese version where he says, huh? Was it you? Bah? It's therefore implied that this Gilgamesh is the same Gilgamesh who appeared in Final Fantasy V, but even still, there are some clear differences. For one, Gilgamesh is no longer using his trusty Naginata, indeed, he has actually abandoned all of his original weapons apart from the Excalibur. In an immediate sense, he chooses to use the Zantetsuken, a weapon native to the world, against Sifa as he has just acquired it, but upon subsequent appearances in the game, he will also use the Excalibur, Excalibur and Masamune. It means the five weapons he previously used, which were all unique, have been replaced by four swords, each of which he used double-handed as he did with the Excalibur in Final Fantasy V. From this, we can infer that he is still on a quest to find the strongest weapons, as he has chosen to ditch those that previously failed him in the fight against Bartz. In terms of his appearance, although we do only see four arms, we can assume that he does still have eight, even though only three are represented on his right side via cutouts with arms painted on them. But there's no mention of Enkidu and there's no mention of the Genji armor. Despite this, Gilgamesh did technically duel Sifa for the first time on a bridge. It's just not a bridge in the traditional sense. Instead, they squared off in the navigational helm of the lunatic Pandora, which in nautical terms is classified as a bridge. It meant that chunks of the original Gilgamesh trope were there, as there was a duel that took place on a bridge, Gilgamesh still had, we can assume, eight arms, and based on how he appeared we can infer that he was still searching for the strongest weapons, but other prominent parts were missing, as there was no mention of Enkidu or the Genji armor. There were also some clear deviations from what we saw in Final Fantasy V, as Gilgamesh now appeared as a summon, and now exclusively used swords. Now, I did mention earlier that Gilgamesh hadn't appeared in Final Fantasy VI, but he was retroactively added into the game following the release of Final Fantasy VI Advance, which came out seven years later. It meant that the role Gilgamesh played wasn't that significant in the grand scheme of things, but even though the setting was different, we got to see an advancement of the Gilgamesh trope in full force. And I'm really sorry about that pun, it was terrible, wasn't it? Anyway, Gilgamesh can be found at the Dragon's Neck Colosseum, and he appears when you choose to bet an Excalibur. Mistaking it for a rare sword, as has now become common with Gilgamesh, he appears to try and claim it for himself, but is ultimately defeated by the party. For this particular appearance, Gilgamesh has returned to using the Naginata in his default form, but he also has access to a wide range of weapons that just aren't visible. During the battle, he can throw various swords, which include the Lightbringer, Ragnarok, Zantetsuken, and the Mitsuno Kami. We can assume that these were picked up on his travels in the realms of Final Fantasy 1, 4, and 8, as the Lightbringer and Ragnarok both appeared exclusively in the Dawn of Souls remaster and were respectively some of the strongest weapons available in that game. Zantetsuken was of course obtained from Odin in Final Fantasy VIII, and the Mitsuno Kami appeared in Final Fantasy IV The After Years as the strongest katana in the game. During the fight, you can also steal various pieces of the Genji armor, and while the duel doesn't take place in or on a bridge, it does take place in a coliseum, which are synonymous with duels, so it kind of fits. Upon defeating Gilgamesh, he offers himself up as a Magicite, which is in keeping with his role as a support character, which was established in Final Fantasy VIII, and it's during his role as a summon that we get to see Gilgamesh fleshed out even further. As he threw the four previous weapons away, Gilgamesh will now use his remaining swords when summoned, Excalibur, Excalibur, and the Masamune. This then means that he was initially carrying at least eight weapons. As we saw during his appearance in Final Fantasy VIII, when he uses these swords, they retain specific colors, and it's also random which one he uses when summoned. But in addition to using the three swords, Gilgamesh now has a potential fourth move, whereby he will summon Enkidu from Final Fantasy V to deal damage that ignores defense. It meant that in Final Fantasy VI Advance, 
Gilgamesh displayed pretty much every major element of the trope, but it also built on previous appearances, with new weapons on display and his reappearance as a summon. The only dubious parts came from fighting in a coliseum instead of a bridge and not displaying all of his arms. But while this representation was rather exemplary of what you'd expect from a Gilgamesh appearance, in Final Fantasy IX, what we saw was rather different from anything that had come before. Acting as a tribute game to much of what had come before in the franchise, Final Fantasy IX reintroduced many classic elements from earlier iterations. It was therefore no surprise that Gilgamesh also appeared within the game's swelling cast of characters. But unlike previous appearances that were heavily inspired by Benkei, the Gilgamesh that appeared in Final Fantasy IX was a much more unique character. Often found in numerous places throughout Gaia, Gilgamesh, otherwise known as Alloway Jack, the four-armed man or brother Gil, was a low-ranking treasure hunter who was often looking to gain fame and wealth by performing nefarious actions like stealing, extorting people, scamming them, and good old-fashioned treasure hunting. This was a clear allusion to the Mesopotamian Gilgamesh, as for all its intents and purposes, despite everything that Gilgamesh achieved in the epic poem, he was also rather brutal and unsympathetic with his methods. Now, unlike all of the previous iterations, in Final Fantasy IX we don't ever see Gilgamesh in combat as either an ally or an antagonist, but we do know that he had four arms as opposed to the standard eight, and that he carried three weapons with him, two daggers and a sword. We also know from a letter written by his brother Enkidu that can be found following a successful Excalibur II run in Memoria, that Gilgamesh was actively seeking Excalibur yet again, and that he was somewhat successful. Enkidu found the sword after following Gilgamesh's instructions, but chose to leave it behind as he thought it had a lame name, and instead chose to pick up the Excalibur. And as a result of this, the party can obtain Excalibur II instead. It meant that, although his appearance was rather unique compared to what had come before, parts of the Gilgamesh trope were still represented. Enkidu now appeared as his brother, as opposed to his psychic, but he was on a quest to find the strongest weapon in the land, and he also had multiple arms, albeit half of what we had previously seen. But he didn't use a Naginata, he didn't fight, and there was no relation between Gilgamesh and the Genji armor that appeared in the game. And as we then moved on to Final Fantasy XI, as Gilgamesh skipped Final Fantasy X entirely, things continued in a similar vein. Except this time, there was almost no connection with the Gilgamesh trope outside of the character having the same name. This particular Gilgamesh was also a non-playable character who was never seen in combat, and similar to the Gilgamesh we saw in Final Fantasy IX, he was associated with piracy too, as, well, he was the leader of the Tenshodo pirating organisation that was based in the village of Norg. Outside of that, it's kind of a stretch to make any meaningful connection, as outside of him potentially being a samurai and therefore having an assumed affinity with swords, nothing else is present. And when he appeared in the trading card game, they even called him Pirate Gilgamesh to try and avoid confusion. But while Final Fantasy IX and XI attempted to add their own unique spin on what it meant to be Gilgamesh, with Final Fantasy XII, the developers decided that it was time to try and return to the original representation of Gilgamesh from Final Fantasy V. In the realm of Ivalice, Gilgamesh was known as a sword collector and a fearsome duelist, but after stealing one too many swords and embarrassing a fellow duelist before then stealing their sword, Mont Blanc ended up posting a priority petition asking for members of Clan Centurio to bring Gilgamesh to justice. To do so, they had to head to the Barheim Passage where, after attempting to cross one of the many bridges found inside, they were confronted by Gilgamesh and his companion Enkidu, and a duel ensued. What's interesting here is that although there are some classic Gilgamesh elements present, there are also some small deviations. For example, Enkidu was now a dog, and Gilgamesh now only had six arms as opposed to the classic eight. And what's unique about this, outside of the obvious reduction, is that Gilgamesh no longer has any open hands. For the first time ever, Gilgamesh now wielded a weapon in every hand. And in keeping with the deviation we saw in Final Fantasy VIII, each weapon Gilgamesh wields is also a sword. These start off as a generic Kotetsu Katana, but as the fight progresses, Gilgamesh will pull out replicas from prominent protagonists in the franchise, as well as two fake versions of the Tornasol and a legitimate version of the Worm Hero Blade, which we can assume he stole from the encounter that instigated the petition. It means that as we saw in Final Fantasy V and VIII, Gilgamesh used weapons that were native to the world he was appearing in. You can also steal parts of the Genji armor from both Gilgamesh and Enkidu throughout the two duels you will have as part of the petition. 
It meant that pretty much every Gilgamesh trope was there, including the ridiculous nature of his actions which were in full display after he's defeated. The only exception was that he didn't use a Naginata, but I think we can forgive the developers for that small oversight. Gilgamesh then reappeared in Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings alongside Enkidu, and there were some other illusions that cropped in too. After previously being defeated in the Barheim Passage, Gilgamesh continued his quest to find the strongest weapons in Ivalice, but he ended up searching so hard that he got lost in the Gates of Shattered Time. Thinking that his encounter with Varn and his allies must therefore be fate, as he would get the chance to claim their weapons, Gilgamesh decided to duel them on another bridge, but he was defeated again. Upon doing so, you are granted the Durandal, which was the strongest one-handed sword in the original Final Fantasy XII, and Gilgamesh will also become a summon, which acted as a reference to his appearances in both Final Fantasy VIII and VI Advance. But even though Gilgamesh had a successful cameo appearance in Final Fantasy XII, he didn't end up appearing as a character at all in Final Fantasy XIII despite plans to do so. In an earlier version of the game, the development team had envisioned Gilgamesh as a hulking Falsi who wielded giant swords, but this idea was canned and Gilgamesh only appeared as a small reference as the name of a shop in the retail network called Gilgamesh Incorporated. He did, however, appear in Final Fantasy XIII II as downloadable content for the Colosseum, and this appearance, although rather limited from the perspective of story exposition, did exhibit some of the more notable Gilgamesh traits that we've established, including his rather quirky attitude, which was perfectly attuned to playing off of snow. As we saw in Final Fantasy VI Advance, the duel against Gilgamesh took place in a Colosseum, and as we saw in Final Fantasy XII, Gilgamesh now only had six arms as opposed to the traditional eight. In the first of the two fights, Gilgamesh actively used a ranged weapon, and no, I'm not counting him throwing swords. But him using the Psychon weaponry does tick the box of using weaponry that's native to the world. In the second encounter, he used replicas of famous weapons that appeared in Final Fantasy VI, IX, X, and Decidia Duodecim, where he'd apparently made a brief stop. The two other weapons he used were another version of Excalibur and a weapon called Bashosen, which he created while running Gilgamesh Incorporated. Its design was said to have been inspired by Enkidu. In addition to all of this, following the defeat of Gilgamesh, there was also a chance to receive some Genji armor, and he also became a recruitable character akin to some of the other appearances we've previously seen. This particular version of Gilgamesh then reappeared in Mobius Final Fantasy to challenge and train Wall, and in Brave Exvius as part of the Attack of Gilgamesh trial event. In Final Fantasy XIV, Gilgamesh appeared in the game not too long after it had been dragged from the brink by Naoki Yoshida and his team. And as you'd expect from a game that has since become known for providing fitting tributes to some of the franchise's more famed characters and moments, what we saw was classic Gilgamesh. After learning of an individual who had been swanning around stealing weapons of warriors that they had defeated in duels, the player bore witness to a rather comical exchange between Gilgamesh and Hildebrand. But before Gilgamesh could be captured for his crimes, he retreated to the Griffin Crossing, a bridge in Ishgard where he challenged the player to a duel. This initial encounter with Gilgamesh revealed some of the classic traits that we'd look for, as we learned that Gilgamesh was on a personal quest to try and find the strongest weapons in the land, and as Benke did, he had been actively taking the weapons of those he had defeated. While he didn't use the Naginata at this point, he did use a halberd that was native to the world, although true to form, it was actually a replica of Neil Van Darnus' weapon. Enkidu was also somewhat present, Gilgamesh claimed to have lost contact with his comrades, so to try and fill the void, so to speak, he tamed a chicken, painted it green, and named it Enkidu. When he appeared later in the questline, as he did in Final Fantasy V, Gilgamesh morphed into his true form and revealed eight arms, something we hadn't actually seen happen since Final Fantasy V, in both the sense of the morph and him also having eight arms. He was also joined by the real Enkidu, who appeared as a winged demon. But unlike Gilgamesh's original appearance, where he only carried five weapons, he now carried seven, which is the exact number that Benke carried. As we had seen before, Gilgamesh was also wielding weapons from games outside of Final Fantasy XIV, with Final Fantasy XI being a specific area of focus this time, as two of the weapons on his right-hand side, the Riddle and the Horticlair, appeared in that specific game.
The weapons also quite heavily mirrored what we saw Gilgamesh use in Final Fantasy V, as there's a mace, a pole arm, an axe, a meaty sword, and in place of the three shuriken, there's a bagnak. The only thing that was missing was an association with the Genji equipment, but the development team clearly had other plans for that, as it's a reward for completing the Delta Scape version 4.0 Savage Raid instead. And that's the fun thing about Gilgamesh. Different development teams had different ways of interpreting what this character means, and this was particularly noticeable with Gilgamesh's appearance in Final Fantasy XV. Acting as the focal point for episode Gladiolus, Gilgamesh was a ruthless warrior who had been acting as the arbiter of talent for the Lucian bloodline since the days of the founder king, Somnus. For over 2,000 years, Gilgamesh had destroyed those who saw fit to challenge his might, but were found wanting. And this was the reason that Gladiolus, on the advice of Kor, sought out Gilgamesh, as he wanted to know within himself that he was strong enough to protect Noctis. Upon encountering Gilgamesh, it was clear that some license had been taken with his visual style and personality, but if he could look past that, then the representation of Gilgamesh was almost textbook. Known to many around Eos as the Blade Master, Gilgamesh wasn't on a personal quest to obtain the strongest weapon in the land, but he did claim weapons of those he defeated as a prize, which was a true representation of Benkei's motivations. Because of this, he did of course use weapons that were native to the world, and one weapon in particular was called the Genji Blade, a weapon that he took when he defeated Kor. This of course does show a connection with Genji equipment, although in its form as a weapon as opposed to the traditional armour. Enkidu was also present, appearing as a winged demon, and both the fight against Enkidu and the subsequent duel, which was the second fight against Gilgamesh, took place on a bridge. There's also a unique angle on the number of arms, as instead of having more than two, Gilgamesh in Final Fantasy XV only has one arm as Kor cut off the other. It meant that, while on face value, the Gilgamesh we saw in Final Fantasy XV may not have seemed like a traditional representation of the character, many of the hallmarks of the trait were still there, and it's actually a very similar story with his representation in Final Fantasy Type-0, another game that was coincidentally directed by Hajime Tabata. Perhaps because this saw Gilgamesh appear as a unique character in a spin-off for the first time, for his appearance in Final Fantasy Type-0, not only did we see some unique twists on the classic trope, we also saw some firsts, including a change to his name, as in Type-0, Gilgamesh is known as Gilgamesh Asher. This played in well with Gilgamesh's role within the narrative of Final Fantasy Type-0, as he was a former king of Lorica, one of the four main nation-states. To help fulfil his duty of protecting his country, he was made an immortal as sea by the Black Tortoise Crystal. And following this action, Gilgamesh's close friend and advisor, Enkidu, was charged with keeping him attuned to his focus. But when Enkidu was killed protecting him from a coup d'etat, Gilgamesh drifted from his path and ended up leading his country to ruin. As a result, Gilgamesh ended up wandering around Orients as a nomad, challenging would-be heroes to duels, and one such duel took place against Class Zero at the Big Bridge, as Rubrum were engaging in a large-scale military conflict against the Militesi Empire. During this particular fight, Gilgamesh only had two arms and used a single sword, but in the third playthrough of the game, assuming certain quests had been completed, the true representation of Gilgamesh appeared, complete with eight arms. What's interesting about this fight is that if you defeated Gilgamesh, he would grant the ultimate weapon to the character that defeated him, but if he defeated you, he would take the character's equipped weapon as a trophy. This particular iteration of Gilgamesh then also appeared in Final Fantasy Awakening, where you could use him as a playable character, and also appeared as a guest character separate to the more traditional Gilgamesh in both Record Keeper and Brave Exvius. Gilgamesh also had an appearance as a secret character in Dissidia Duodecim, which is connected to the original Final Fantasy V Gilgamesh that had been recurring in many other games. And this is noted by Gilgamesh in Final Fantasy XII, using a weapon that he picked up in World B. But almost every other representation of Gilgamesh within the wider spin-offs has been more of a tribute, as opposed to evolving the character in any way. They were just cameos for a character who had already been established elsewhere. This includes the Theatrhythm series, Pictlogica, and other earlier mobile titles like Artnix, Airborne Brigade, and All the Bravest, but it also includes more recent titles like Final Fantasy Explorers and World of Final Fantasy. I would just like to say though that seeing Gilgamesh parlay with Snow again in World of Final Fantasy was priceless. It means though 
that when looking at Gilgamesh as a whole, there has been quite a lot of evolution and deviation throughout his various appearances. Some of these have been iterations on the original character that did appear in Final Fantasy V, while others have been much more unique interpretations. But even with the more unique versions, there has still always been at least one thing that managed to connect that particular Gilgamesh to all the others. And I don't know about you guys, but I find that absolutely fascinating. It's why we thoroughly enjoy pulling together these evolution videos, as they help to shine a light on concepts that are core to the franchise that perhaps aren't always front and centre in the way that you might think. I mean, who would have thought that there would be so many different elements that contribute to what it means to be Gilgamesh, or that they would have evolved in all the small little ways that they did? What's perhaps the most interesting though, is that unlike the previous evolution videos where when there was a unique variant created that it would be iterated upon, in the case of Gilgamesh, these unique variations just didn't resonate with future creators for whatever reason. Some elements did, such as Gilgamesh only having 6 arms in Final Fantasy XII and XIII too, but it would have been interesting to see what would have happened if the Gilgamesh from Final Fantasy IX appeared somewhere else too. But that's enough random conjecture for now, as we are at the end of this video. Be sure to let us know in the comments which has been your favourite interpretation of Gilgamesh, and of course, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. This video represented our third look into recurring motifs and tropes running throughout the Final Fantasy series, and as you can probably tell by the length of these videos, they really are a labour of love. We are always on the lookout for interesting topics to study though, so be sure to let us know in the comments if there are any specific ones that you would like us to take a look at. If you value what we do, why not also consider supporting us on Patreon? As we've mentioned before, this video series actually started out as a suggestion from a Patreon supporter, and that's just one of the rewards we currently have on offer. Another is getting your name seen at the end of videos alongside these guys you're seeing right now. Alright, thank you so much for watching guys. This is Daryl, signing out. I'll see you soon for more Final Fantasy videos.